So we do, uh, we call it personalized dementia care, or it actually, you've, maybe you've heard the word functional medicine. Functional medicine is a different way of practicing. Instead of just dealing with the smoke, you deal with the fire. Well, most of what we do in medicine, uh, treating blood pressure that's elevated, I can give you a drug that lowers your blood pressure. But if I dealt with the problem that caused the blood pressure, what if I went upstream to what the cause of that blood pressure was and fix that. Then I wouldn't just have to give you the $250 a month pill to control your blood pressure. Same with diabetes. All these Ozempics and drugs are now being used for weight loss, hundreds of dollars a month. But if you went upstream and figured, let's fix this person's diet, you could make 90% or more of type two diabetes go away if you could do that. But no one pays for that. We pay for Ozempic. $500, what's the new one? Monjero, $700 a month, whatever it's going to be. Um, we need our system to change. But what we do is individualize the care. We go upstream and look at the causes of why you may have dementia symptoms. Now, we do see people uh, who don't have dementia. We see people for preventive. They say, I know I have risk factors. I want to uh, assess those. I want to plan for how I can minimize my risk factors so I don't get dementia. We do those too. But it doesn't matter uh, what, um, well, it does matter what phase of dementia you're in. The earlier you are, the better. The earlier you are in your progress, the more good we can do for you. That's true. But we don't give up on anybody. If you can make it into our office and get through our three hour interview, we'll take you and we'll help you. And we think when you work on risk factors, you're going upstream to the cause as much as anything. And doesn't that make more sense anyway than just treating the symptoms? When you get your first symptom of dementia, let's say at age 65, you've had the process going on for 30 years before that. Your brain has a marvelous ability through a process much like pruning an apple tree or thinning the radishes. It helps the brain continue to function without symptoms 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years before your first symptom pops out. Now, they didn't teach us that in medical school. We didn't know that 30 years before dementia, that's where the action is. If we get people when they're 30 or 40 and, can, and try to convince a 30-year-old that they need to do preventive medicine, that's another story. But, um, but that's where it's at. If we can get upstream 20 or 30 years and prevent it, that would work better than any of the drugs we have today. And I maintain what we do. What we do, we didn't invent this model of care. Dr. Bredesen, Dale Bredesen in California did. We try to emulate what he and others do. Dr. Richard Isaacson at Wild Cornell in New York and others, we're, we're emulating what they do. We didn't invent this. But I think it's the right way to go. And as a matter of fact, almost anything that I say here today, someone could argue against what I say. But that's true of every medical meeting. It doesn't matter what you say. There could be somebody in the back of the room they'll say, well, I did a study and it didn't show that, it showed this. Okay, that's true. But what you're getting from me here today is my sifting through hours and hours, books, articles, podcasts, et cetera, and you're getting it from me and these are my opinions as we said in the disclaimer. But it's the best I can offer you and it's advice that I would follow myself. So my, my kids always give me a grief if I pull out the Giardilli chocolate bar and it's now what, Papa, is that what you're supposed to have? <laughs> and um, when the checkout lady at Barley's gives me a, a funny look when I pull something out, I, I see it's for the grandkids. It's not for me. But um, important that um, whatever system you have, that you support the caregivers. You know, I see evaluations from all over the place. We read the evaluations people have already had from medical centers, even our very largest medical center in the whole state. There's very little said about caregivers. What we at our, do at our Dementia Resource Center, 90% of what we do is helping caregivers. Sure, we help the person living with dementia, and that's the word we use, the person living with dementia. And you'll see that abbreviation in the notes here. But um, if, you, if you isolate the person as a case, you're taking them out of the family context of 
what's really important. The whole family, it's a whole family issue. And you can't just isolate a case and do a good job. You can do it, but then you get, there's nothing we can do come back in a year. Well, that doesn't fly either. There's lots we can do. And a lot of it has to do with diet, lifestyle, and so forth. And our personalized system, we look at medications. Many people come to us on medications that have cognitive side effects. Four of them. It's not unusual. If you're taking a drug that has cognitive side effects and you have cognitive dysfunction at some level, what's wrong with this picture? Maybe that needs to change. So um, we think that on average, if you have 10 medications or 12, we'll probably be able, with collaborating with your primary care clinician, get you off two or three of those. What if the 100,000 people living with dementia in Minnesota all got off two or three pills? Over a year, do you know how many millions of dollars that would save? And could that money be funneled back into a system of dementia care clinics like ours, 25 of them throughout the state of Minnesota, so no one has to drive more than 30 miles? I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but that's kind of my vision, where we want to go with this. Other states have that. Other, Wisconsin has over 40 memory clinics scattered around the state. They started with a $3.5 million grant in Madison, Wisconsin several years ago, and they have a huge staff of people. And they don't use the model of care that I would prefer, but they still have memory clinics scattered throughout the state. Florida has similar, Florida has gigantic clinics. Each one is like a Mayo Clinic. It's only 13 clinics. I prefer the smaller clinics in more places model. We do, as I uh, mentioned, these uh, evaluations. We do an intake. We'll talk about that in particular. We do an intake. Tammy or Christina does that. And um, that's where we get the people who are insincere or just looking for a quick fix. She'll tell them, our system isn't for you. This isn't drive through, stick your arm out the window, get a shot, and on your way. We're way more, we, we demand way more of our clients than that. It takes a commitment. <laughs> Uh, we do the preventive evaluations, so we've done quite a few of those. And people are amazed at what they can do from a prevention standpoint, even starting with medications, even in their 40s or 50s, before they have any symptoms. We do caregiver coaching. Tammy and Christina are veterans. They've been doing this for 15 or more years, between them dealing with dementia behaviors. And caregiver coaching is a lifesaver for many people. We do education. We've given over 36 talks, and uh, some big ones, some little ones. But every time we do, we get a little bit more input and feedback of what people are really worried about. And uh, that's helped us. Uh, we're also starting a dementia-informed counseling. Kay DeFries, who's one of our volunteers, is helping us get that set up. Uh, we've had to rework our original concept, but that will be starting soon. What we've noticed is when people have been married for 55 and 60 years, you know, it's sort of like how you might feel about a, a baseball great like Yogi Berra walks into the room. But we've seen people perform at that level in their relationships, and it's such a privilege for us to see in our evaluations. And, um, but, you know, after 55 years, you've sort of gotten a rhythm to your relationship. And when dementia gets in there, it throws you off the track. And it's really tough. And I can see, we can see two or three visits with a professional to help you get reoriented. A lot of it has to do with denial in the caregiver. Oh, he's not writing the checks anymore because he always wrote the checks and he's just being mean. Well, he has cognitive dysfunction. He can't, they can't see it. They're, these are intelligent people, but the denial that my big, strong check writer can't do it anymore, the denial is there. A few visits to a counselor we think would help get people back on track with their relationship of 55 years. So we're, we've seen the need for that and we're swimming upstream, but we're gonna make that happen. So um, this is a lot about uh, what we do there, but primarily it's about empowering primary care clinicians to do dementia care with us helping. Um, we decide that we're going to do and find what works for dementia care. And I think we've found that. 
we have many things that we can fix and make better. Now we're going to have to go out and figure out how we're going to get insurance and Medicare to pay for it. Dr. Tack and I are volunteers. You're not going to get 30-year-old volunteers to do what we're doing. So we need to find a way to pay for it. We do pay our other staff, but we live on grants and donations. So feel free to use the donation packets that are conveniently placed on your table here today. Um, but uh, as I said, the, um, the neurologists just don't have the capacity to see every dementia patient. So we think we can empower primary care to do 90% of routine dementia care. Um, so the education we talked about, what you guys are seeing up here is way bigger. I'm with my uh, newly good eyes. I'm trying to read the tiny letters way back there. Oh, and the dementia services providers. That's the word we use to describe. I don't know. I've got my glasses. Oh, no. I thought these are yours. Oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yeah, it doesn't help for 30 feet away. Small. Oh. It, it only helps for here. Uh, but um, we want to accept them into the treatment management community system of dementia care as colleagues. They weren't being found. When Kathy Gilbride called me into their office, which paradoxically was the old medical group building downtown uh, six or seven years ago, she said, the doctors aren't finding the dementia services people. And she knew we had done public health campaigns before for whooping cough and controlled substances. She said, why don't you do one on dementia? And uh, we studied the problem, and sure enough, I, we had no idea who these people were. Well, there's 10 or so of them down the hall. Please visit them today and ask what they do. Even if it doesn't pertain to you, you might know somebody who could utilize those services. So I'd ask you to go and talk with them. Ask them what their favorite cigarette is, and that'll get the conversation going. <laughs> so um, like this kid on the front of the St. Paul Science Museum, we want to dream big. We want to dream big and maybe consider getting 25 or 30 clinics like ours around the state. We think it's best if hardly anyone has to drive more than 30 miles. We want the clinic to be a regular place of comfort. You can go there and not worry about showing your deficits and feel accepted there. And you can talk. You know, we, we started doing our evaluations. It took three hours. The, the, the final evaluation. There's a preliminary one and then the chart review. And the final one we call the initial evaluation. And they took about three hours. And we thought, how are we going to get 82-year-old couple to sit through three hours? Well, they loved it. They didn't want to leave. We couldn't believe it. And, you know, it'd take bathroom breaks or sip water or whatever. But um, people like the fact that this is like a home base for dementia care. It actually caused a bit of a problem because we do have support groups. But people, I think, felt a little bit less of a need of support groups if they have a phone availability. They can call Tammy or Christina or me and get support almost any time. And that's so unusual in medicine in general. And I don't know how long we'll be able to keep doing that, but it seems to work. It seems to be what people need. They feel very supported when they have a center, a place, a center of excellence to deal with this problem that they're so embarrassed about. Chris Tackle told me a story once about, um, you know, when we do Medicare annual wellness exams, we do a little mini cog, a little memory test. And I think sometimes you do a MOCA as well. I, I, I don't remember, but um, anyway, Chris told me once that uh, a guy came in for his third or fourth annual Medicare annual wellness. And as soon as Chris walked in the room, the guy says, face velvet church, Daisy Red. <laughs> right off the bat. Because they were so anxious about that going in. And you shouldn't have to feel anxious about it. We're on your side. And if we are careful with our words, we make you feel comfortable doing that. Maybe we'll chuckle a little bit like we just did. Life is far too serious to be taken too seriously. So we chuckle and you, and it's not unusual in our evaluation to hear laughter and mirth coming forth from the room. And our staff can attest to that. So um, 
this, this network of dementia resource clinics would have to have a state sponsorship in some way. So if I can get new providers coming in to do what I'm doing, I'll have more time to go down and talk to the powers that be in the state or the medical school. I'd prefer it to actually be run by the medical school, similar to what they do in Wisconsin. And um, it would require training. You need specific training to do what we're doing. We're, we're self-taught, I hate to say it, but we're, we are self-taught over six or seven years, and we're still learning and we'll never learn at all. So just so you know. Uh, but the state would uh, also put some pressure on insurance companies who stand to save hundreds of millions of dollars to put some of that money back into programs like what we're talking about here. So if you have any leverage with your legislators, please talk to them about that very same thing. Now I put way more words on each slide than you're supposed to do for these, but in case you forget or you, you wanna just, if you can, and we'll have copies of the slides on the website, you can review it later. You could get a lot just by reading the slides. This is where we work and this, is the Minnesota Center, the beautiful building. The Center Care donates the space to us. They even pay our utilities. So Center Care believes in what we're doing. They've been very helpful. They even give us a bunch of equipment and so forth. But we have an office here. It's all on one floor. Some of you have been there, and we're very grateful for that. So we have to follow the rules, and the rules of um, something called the Stark Law says that an entity cannot order tests that benefits itself. So we're not allowed because of the Stark Law uh, to order the tests that we recommend at the end of our evaluations. We send a report back to the primary care clinician and ask them to order the test. Now that's a little uncomfortable because sometimes they do them and sometimes they don't. And we're trying to prove the benefits of what we do, but if the Referring clinician only does half the tests that we recommend. How are we gonna measure our success? So we're, we're, we're struggling with that. So we're just waiting for a donor to give us about $60,000 a year so we pay our rent and then we can order all the tests we want. But anyway, we have this lovely building. This is the office and those um, ugly brown chairs, no one ever sits in those because that's the waiting room. No one ever sits there. How many people go to the doctor's office and the doctor and the staff greet you at the door? That's what we do. The only people that use those chairs are the eye doctor right next door. When their waiting room is full, they come and sit in our office. But other than that, nobody sits in those chairs. Now, during these talks, I've asked my colleagues here to stop me if there's anything unusual that I said or needs further clarification. So far, we're okay, right? Okay. Great because I don't want to just be a talking head here. But how do we survive? Well, we get a lot of in-kind support from our board members. So Brad Hansen from um, Quinlan Van Hughes Law Firm has done lots of work for us. He's been very helpful. And Marie Primus from Bergen KDV, the accounting firm, she just does nonprofit accounting. She's been very helpful with our tax returns and all that financial stuff. Um, Bob Mahold from just down the street here, Mahold Insurance has been very helpful. And several of our board members, like Rick Tandler here, helping us with planning and strategic planning. And he helped us uh, clear out our office recently when we had to clean up our files. So we get good support from our board of directors and uh, we have some fabulous volunteers. Uh, but we're pretty much dependent on grants. We get some lovely grants and at the end of the um, conference today, we'll put up all the grantor people. Uh, Minnesota Board on Aging, um, uh, actually the Minnesota Medical Association gave us a small grant and others, but grants and donations. So we currently do billing and coding and all that, and it's a disaster because insurance companies don't want to pay for dementia. And why? Because Medicare doesn't pay for dementia. If Medicare doesn't pay for it, they don't want to pay for it. Now, surprise the heck out of me when Health Partners sent us a check for $50,000 before the end of the year. They believe in what we're doing, but when we submit bills, we submit a bill for 100, we get 17 or whatever, equivalent. So actually we're working 
for almost less than what we used to pay our babysitter per hour. So that's not going to work, not forever. We need to fix that. So we exist on donations and grants until we can convince our federal legislators who do Medicare and our state legislators who could pressure the insurance companies to kick in some funds to support what we're doing until we can make that happen. But tell you, that's a long-term goal. Uh, it doesn't happen very quickly. Each of our evaluations in total is about five or six hours. Uh, the intake is 90 minutes to two hours. That's what Tammy or Christina does. Uh, my chart review is usually online. I go online. We have ways to do that and look through the chart for, on the average, 90 minutes, sometimes two hours if it's complicated. And we build a report. It starts with the intake. Tammy gives it to me. I build it further with the chart review. And then we have the initial evaluation, the big evaluation. Christina or Tammy will be there with me. Uh, Christina Wojcicki, our community health person, will be there. And sometimes we'll have medical students or residents. And this is a golden opportunity for us to influence and twist the arm of the young doctors to, be, to maybe go into this. Right now, they all have a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt, and they're thinking, I'm going to be a dermatologist, you know, <laughs> or a radiologist, so I can pay off that debt before I retire. Uh, so we have some work to do in, on uh, doing that. But um, our evaluations take about six hours total. Some have taken longer. Um, but what they're paying us doesn't really cover that. But what we found is that this is what it takes. You can't do dementia care in a 20-minute office. I don't care who you are. So this is Tammy and me. Do you remember that day, Tammy, when we put the decal up on the door? That was really exciting. It was during the COVID. As you can see, we had our masks on. But uh, to date, we've seen almost 200 clients. There's a lot of other outputs here. We started two years ago. Um, Two years ago, we actually started over at Whitney for the first several months. And it wasn't until September of uh, that year, five months, we were at Whitney. And we're grateful to the city of St. Cloud, who owns and operates Whitney, for letting us have our start in the um, little room at Whitney. And uh, we've taken care of or talked with or supported 474 caregivers. A better word for caregiver is care partner. But when I say care partner, nobody knows what I'm talking about. So I'm going to keep using caregiver. Because you are a care partner for many years. Maybe it, towards the end of life, you're a caregiver. But um, that's a lot of people that we've helped. And we think we've helped the caregivers as much or more as the people living with dementia. We've been to health fairs. We've tried the different things. We've had speaking engagements. It's fun because we do a speaking engagement. The following weeks, we get all kinds of consultations, so it's kind of fun. And we've been careful not to get overwhelmed so that we're making people wait more than a month or two. We've rarely gone over a month. Getting ready for this concert, we've sort of, uh, or this um, summit, we've kind of gotten behind, but um, we're trying not to make people wait. So, hey, um, <coughs> Dr. Zook. Yes, ma'am. Um, could someone just show up at your door? Or do they have to be referred by their primary care doctor? Or how does that work? Well, we have people show up at our door every day because they think we're the eye doctor's office and they walk in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of a little joke among us. But so people walk in all the time. But in reality, um, I've seen people walk in and um, our staff, I don't know how they do it, but they find a way to, you know, get, take their name and number and get them an appointment. and. It's kind of like primary care when I started in 1977. Everyone knew my nurse, and they would just call Jan, and Jan knew what to do. And it, it, so it's a little bit like that. So, and I don't know when we get really big if that's going to change, but I hope not. But, but they can self-refer. You can self-refer. So what we do is we back consult. So Mary Smith walks into our office. We get her set up. We ask who her primary care clinician is. And then we have them take the report to their primary care clinician, which is usually, usually the first that the clinician finds out about it. And then um, hopefully the clinician, clinician will call me. They, they really don't call me very often, which I'm a little disappointed because I want to have the opportunity to talk to them more. But um, we've had referrals from the residency. We get a lot of referrals from social workers who see 
a situation that's dire and difficult. Uh, we get referrals from friends of our former clients fairly commonly. So then we back consult with their primary care. Sometimes we're well received because they already know about us and sometimes we're not so well received. Like, who's this Zook character? What's he doing making all these recommendations? I've been a doctor for five years. Why would he tell me what to do? You know, I mean, we're trying not to do that. We're trying to not be that way, but uh, we feel a sense of urgency that our legislators don't feel. Did I satisfy that question? Yep, thank you. <laughs> uh, and again, I'll remind you, if you have questions, write them down, hold them up, and people will come and pick them up. And those of you online, please uh, submit them in the chat box. So we've learned a lot. We've learned that these relationships that people have had for 50 and 60 years are incredible. There's a lot of healing power in us maintaining that relationship. And so we don't take the people out of context of where they live and who they live with. You can't do that with dementia. You have to take all that into consideration. 90% of what we do is supporting the caregiver and the family. And the person living with dementia usually is in a good mood when we see them for some reason, and they're content. But um, we've learned that those relationships are special, and if we get a dementia-informed counseling program going, we'll keep those relationships. And there is a lot of healing power in those relationships and we recognize that. And that's why we're getting that counseling program going. Um, we did a survey recently and I don't know if any of you are business people, but you know, if you send out a survey quite often, you'll get three or 4% response rate. We sent it out to 120 of our clients and asked them, how are we doing? 44 responded, which is incredible return rate. And of the 44, all but one gave us five out of five for every category. So we think, now maybe the others that didn't respond, and people called us and said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't respond because of this or that. I mean, they felt bad that they couldn't respond. But it tells us we're on the right track, at least from their, their satisfaction. Now we're gonna satisfy Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Medica, and Medicare, I don't know. But the customers, the people, the clients that we take care of like what we're doing so far. Um, and then our grant makers, our grant makers have been, you know, from the state especially, uh, have been very helpful to us. They want us to succeed. So even if it, in the cases where we didn't fill the grant application out, they called us even after the deadline and said, if you just do this, then we can approve you. I mean, that's unheard of. People are so impressed with our mission. Our mission is to improve access to quality dementia care in our community. And what's our community? Well, our community, as far as our influence reaches, which is to the edges of Minnesota right now. We've had people come from Alexandria, the cities, Pine City, I mean, all over the state. We don't turn anyone away as long as they can get to our door. We can't see people in another state, but they can come here if they want to. Um, we are getting an electronic medical record. We're hoping to scale up to the much larger federal grant. And a federal grant requires you to have electronic medical record. We're pretty much doing it by uh, Microsoft products and uh, we have all kinds of security, privacy and all that. But when we get electronic medical record, we think QMD will be really good at that. And you might say, well, why don't you just do the EPIC system that the hospital uses? Well, um, it's too hard. <laughs> Let me just say it's too hard. We need to get it done right away, and therefore, uh, QMD was able to do it right away. Uh, right away is a relative term. In computer world, that means within six months. Um, so we've been collaborating with several agencies of the state. They've been very helpful. They've been very uh, generous in their promotion of what we're doing. We talk to people all the time. We have people come into our Dementia Resource Center and say, I'm so-and-so, my business is this, uh, it's part of the state network of that, and we want to work with you. We do that all the time. And that collaboration is what we're talking about, the community response to dementia. This big, hairy problem of dementia management is too big for just our clinic or just me or any of our staff. We need all kinds of collaboration. 
and the government agencies have the power and um, at the medical school, uh, we think we'll find good collaboration. We have an opportunity, the St. Cloud Hospital is going to have a medical school develop in town here, which we wanna get the baby doctors on board with what we're doing and the other practitioners, you know, the nurse practitioners, uh, uh, physician assistants, the social workers, and all the other people that will be part of that organization. And um, I was going to be on a phone call with uh, Dr. Cindy Smith just the other day, and we missed connections, but um, talking about the medical school and the opportunities for dementia care to be taught at an early phase. Now, when you're a dean of a medical school, people call you all the time and try to tell you what you need to teach those doctors. And we get that. But this is gonna be a big part of our medical, what we need to do in our community. And so we think uh, we have a great opportunity with that. So I'll entertain any questions if we have any. I never thought I would see Pat Zook done <laughs> half an hour early. <laughs> Actually, like I said, I'm a better counter puncher than puncher, so uh, <laughs> go ahead and fire away. We already had some questions online. Anyway, there's a question about does um, vitamin deficiency have a lot to do with dementia or brain health? Well, of course it does. You know, but um, vitamins uh, deals with nutrition. And the amount of nutrition education that we got in medical school was a thimbleful and barely that. So um, it turns out when we get older, we don't absorb vitamins as well as we did when we, when we were young. And the vitamins most critical for brain and nerve function are the B vitamins. B1, which is thiamine, B6, which is pyridoxine, B9, which is folic acid, B12, which is cyanocobalamin, and others in the B category. If you don't have stomach acid, you can't absorb those. Well, why wouldn't I have stomach acid? Well, do you take omeprazole every day of your life? Like, several million people do in this country, or drugs like it? Yeah. Well, if you don't have stomach acid, it's very hard for your body to absorb your B12 pill or your B complex pill, or the B vitamins stacked in your good food that you're eating. So even if you eat food that contains the B vitamins, and you're not gonna absorb that and have your body have access to it if you don't have any stomach acid. And a lot of people are running around with very little stomach acid. So if you take omeprazole twice a day or Pepsi twice a day or whatever twice a day, you're not going to absorb vitamins. And even without that, people lose the ability to create stomach acid, even without pills. By the time we're 65 and older, your stomach acid goes way down. And so vitamins are very important. And, you know, my colleagues, when I see their evaluations where they've already seen the patient for dementia, they do a B12, and every once in a while, they'll do a folate. Other than that, they have no idea what, how important the B vitamins are. When I was in residency and training, we had people come into the county hospital who were in alcohol withdrawal. And you remember the first thing we did, we gave them a shot of thiamine, B1. Because if we didn't, if we fed them carbohydrates with inadequate B1, they got very sick. It was an emergency. So. Um, but other than that, we had very little training about that. Um, but I'm kind of into the food stuff and the nutrition stuff, as you'll see as we go on here today. But yes, vitamins are very important. And um, I can't make a blanket recommendation for very many things because what I would think is right for you as an individual may not be right for the very next person. But there aren't too many places where I think you'll get in trouble taking a B-complex vitamin other than your wife will get mad because you're, when you drip urine on the toilet, it's bright yellow spots, you know, so that's, that doesn't go over well. But that's the worst of it, and your urine smells funny. But people ask about vitamins all the time. Um, but supplements is a big thing, and I read about supplements all the time, and the experts who do supplements, they'll take 70 or 80 of them a day. Well, there isn't room in your stomach for that much vitamins. I don't know how they do that. Thank you, ma'am. What foods are high in B vitamins? Well, um, the carnivore diet has a lot of B vitamins, unfortunately. 
Uh, but you can get it from uh, green leafies as well. So the green leafy spinach and kale and all that stuff. I've tried eating kale several times. My mistake was I got the one with the stems in it. And you're chewing those stems, it gets stuck in your teeth. It isn't much fun. But um, B vitamins, uh, you, you can get a lot from uh, animal products. But um, it's a big argument back and forth about whether we should eat animal products. So I, I'm a believer in grass-fed beef. Um, I think if the cow eats corn all day and all its life and gets sick from eating corn, because cows aren't supposed to eat corn, they'll be fat and have a lot of fat and their, their meat will taste good. But they're really sick. And there isn't much vitamins and nutrients in the meat other than the pure protein. When the cows eat grass, they get vitamin K from the grass. And most of you probably never heard of vitamin K. Vitamin K is critical for brain function. And it's in the grass. So when the cow eats the grass and we eat the cow, we get the vitamin K. Unless you take it as a supplement, that's a, a common way to get your vitamin K. Now, vitamin K is also in the green leafies. And uh, people who are on cumin and a blood thinner that works by binding your vitamin K, uh, they can't eat too much green. So, I'm um, just setting a timer so you don't go over. <laughs> thank you <laughs> for sharing that. How are we doing on the... I have to check my watch. We have a couple questions over here. Okay, fire away. Uh, somebody wanted to know about the hereditary predisposition and the whole genetics piece. Yeah, so the question is about genetics and dementia. So there are cases where people, even at a young age in their 20s and 30s, get dementia. And that's a strong hereditary predisposition. That's less than 2% of dementia. And there were cases in South America and Central America where this was very common based on a genetic variant. But that's quite rare, and we've not seen that. But what you do inherit is the tendency to smoke. What you do inherit is a tendency to get diabetes. What you do inherit is a tendency to get high blood pressure. You do inherit sleep apnea in, to some extent. You inherit coronary artery disease. <coughs> And when you inherit those, you inherit the risk for dementia that is increased when you have those conditions. So in a sense, you could say it's inheritable, but it's more cultural than anything else in terms of the smoking. Although I think the genetics, and they're talking about genetic skipping uh, generations, and we'll talk a little bit more about personal trauma and how that can affect not only the children of the person suffering trauma, but the grandchildren. And that's kind of mysterious to me, but. There's a lot of arguments about genetics, and just about everything we do in medicine now is genetics-based. There's very few articles written that don't mention genetic alleles, like six digits with numbers and letters that don't mean anything to us, but it indicates a gene that makes a protein. But it's very, very uh, uh, complex. The good news about genetics is we can overcome bad genetics. Now, we didn't learn that in medical school. You have Gene A, gene A causes you to have your hair curly. You're gonna have curly hair if you have gene A. Well, it's not that simple. Because gene B, C, and D control the expression of gene A. And if you eat these kind of foods and you climb mountains or some other oddball variable, you suppress gene A and you don't get curly hair. So it's way complicated. But um, you can overcome bad genes. Now, you may have heard of the APOE4 allele. That's a common genetic test that people have done, which does increase your risk for dementia. If you, you, for, for alleles, you get two copies, one from your parent, either parent. And if you get a double copy of APOE4, your risk for dementia is like 80% or more. But even those folks, if they get into a program like Dr. Bredesen's, like what we're talking about here, and do the things 100%, you can suppress the expression of that gene so that dementia symptoms don't pop out, even though you have the genes for it. We never learned that in medical school. We thought if you had gene A, you get the effect of gene A. And the, the effect of the gene is called the phenotype. So you're not doomed if you have APOE4. Even if you have two copies, don't give up hope. But we're at the APOE4, we can't get the geneticist to even order those tests. Nobody wants to do the test because then you have to give someone the result. 
And the geneticists are afraid that if I give you a horrible result, you're going to go out and kill yourself, then I'll get sued. Nobody wants to do that. So when we ask them, can we, you think we can do it? Oh, no, let's not do genetic tests. Where it's going to matter is when we do have drugs that are effective for dementia. They won't be used when you already have dementia. They'll be used when you're 30 or 40 years old and the biomarker tests indicate a high risk. That's when we'll use the drug. Not when the barn is burned down, that's too late. So, um, and genetics will drive what medications are needed. So right now, we, like for depression, we just pick one and say, oh, let's try this one, you know, and 20 years from now, that'll look so archaic because you will never prescribe an antidepressant without knowing the genotype. And the artificial intelligence will tell you, you never want to give uh, this particular antidepressant to this person because they have this, that, and that gene profile. But uh, it's very complex. Rick Tandler on their board is talking about AI development. He has some connections. And there's no way to do dementia well, really well, without using artificial intelligence, AI. And that's where it's going to be. It's going to be that way for a lot of medical, complex medical care. Nobody wants to do that. We have a couple of uh, related questions. One is, uh, and this is a, I know it will be more of a complex answer. What doctors in the St. Cloud area uh, deal with dementia? And kind of also related, will insurance cover if my doctor writes a referral? Now, that's a good question. The, the question is about insurance coverage and who does dementia. Well, not to brag, but we do dementia care, so we do that. Um, but um, we found family doctors and nurse practitioners and physician assistants who do a credible job. So, but you have to ask them. You remember, the way we do medicine is when they take on a complex case, they're taking on a financial loss. It's a financial liability to do complex care. You get paid for production, and you can't produce in dementia care. You just can't. If you can do one in the morning, one in the afternoon, well, you'd go out of business. And when you bill $10 and Medicare pays you 58 cents, I mean, how long can you keep the doors open? So. Other, but so they asked about who does it, and um, you could just call around, and I hate to give you the names of people that we've seen, but um, what people used to do when they wanted to know something about our practices, they would call our nurses, who do everything about, everybody does, you know, which of us does this or that. And it's true in family medicine, like some people are better at procedures, like Kim, you did, and Chris, you both did a lot of procedures. So uh, it would, and even though it's primary care, certain of the clinicians were good at this or that, and we would tend to cross-refer to each other. Doing that. So what has been your experience, Pat, as far as if you get a referral from your primary care physician, getting you know uh, that covered by insurance? It, well, in terms of your needs as the client, you don't have to worry. We take the financial hit if it doesn't get paid. You, we, no one's ever paid a dollar out of their pocket for any of our services. Now, plenty of people have given us nice donations, but we didn't specifically demand that for service. They were all voluntary donations. But no one's paid a nickel uh, out of their own pocket. We take what insurance gives us, which isn't very much. And again, we have to fix that. That's not feasible for the long term. Did I cover that well enough, Chris? Yeah, we get that question many times here. And so um, uh, just to repeat, we're not going to give you names of anyone in particular. Talk to your primary care doctor. They can refer you to neurology or to Dr. Zook's clinic. You can go, you can self-refer as well. Um, another question, um, this is, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. So I recently read a book called Together by uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who is the um, Surgeon General in the US. And he is also just this week, I think, coming out with a big US plan. Um, the idea is that loneliness is really killing us. <laughs> and if nothing we learned from the pandemic, it was that um, not having social interaction was really hard on our mental health, even our physical health, 
and our memory. Um, can you talk a little bit about the research in that? It's very extensive now. In the pandemic really brought this out. The problem is loneliness is something we don't want to admit to. We don't want to admit to loneliness because we're ashamed of that. And that's, that's a barrier. That's a big barrier to solving that. And what we're finding, you know, as I mentioned before, the three hour discussions that we have for our evaluation, people are so, it's pent up lonely. They just like talking with someone who, some nice person talking to you is really solving that. But loneliness affects you uh, in so many ways. It can lead to depression. It can lead to anxiety. Depression can physically incapacitate you, make it hard for you to exercise. You don't exercise, you don't sleep as good. You don't sleep as good, all sorts of other mayhem. Your blood pressure goes up. Things doctors can measure, your blood sugar goes up because you're stressed. So um, loneliness is part of the pandemic and that backwash is gonna go on for years. Because here's the deal, when you're 22 and you get out of college or 21 and you get out of college, you got all kinds of friends, you can figure it out, or you could move to another city and develop a culture of friends. Most 22 year olds can do that. I'll tell you when you're 82 and you've been holed up in your house for two or three years, it's hard to go out and reestablish those relationships, calling and getting called, meeting, book groups, all sorts of things. And so why not just go over to Whitney? I know it's a program it's put on and people don't like being part of a program, but Whitney has all kinds of events where you can sit and talk to people. What's not to like about that? I, we think faith groups can be a great collaboration for us. And we don't say churches, we say faith groups because sometimes they're a mosque or there's other names for it. But faith groups, if we can convince the faith group leaders to foster a visiting uh, a group of volunteers visiting those who are older, living isolated. Do you realize that 25% of the people with dementia in Minnesota live alone? 25% live alone? Now maybe their daughter and their son live on the same street and stop by every day, but they're living alone. I think the churches, our, our church even had a, a visit people I forget what they called it. We had visiting nurses. We had the parish nurse concept, which was good. Um, and my friends who do delivered home uh, delivered meals, they say people are grateful for the meal, but they really want to sit down and talk. <laughs> so they deliver the mac and cheese, and it gets cold sitting there while they're talking, because what they really wanted was somebody to talk to. Like, oh my gosh. But it's hard to go out and reestablish, especially when the pandemic has thrown us off kilter, off the track of social calling, being called and all that. And it's, it just sucks the life out of people. So how do you tell someone they're a little bit defensive about, you know, you're accusing me of being lonely? I've got friends, I've got lots of friends, you know. My daughter in Chicago, she calls me like every month. So, um, but we're defensive about loneliness. So it's hard to approach. And, you know, as a physician, there's nothing more frustrating than seeing a problem, knowing how to take care of it, but not being allowed in. The patient puts up a barrier and doesn't allow you in. And quite often it's due to denial or just feeling, you know, kind of embarrassed about it. So I think it's incumbent on faith groups to do that. Not everyone has a faith group. So other, like Whitney Senior Center is another fabulous resource. Not every city of our size has a, a resource like that. Or uh, go to concerts. A lot of people, we have these summer by, summertime by George concerts, you know, and it's outdoors. So if you're worried about COVID, it's outdoors. I think it's a little bit safer. And they have nice music and so forth. Um, somebody has a question about anesthesia. So that will kind of lead us into the toxin question. I don't know if you're addressing that later or if you want to tackle that now. Well, the, um, so a risk factor for dementia is having multiple general anesthetics, multiple. So um, 
So when you, when you go to have surgery and you're going to have a general anesthetic, the anesthesiologist or the anesthetist will talk to you. Do you have any concerns? That's when you say, how are you going to protect my brain during surgery? Because if they let, if they just keep your oxygen normal, but they let the carbon dioxide get too high, that could cause a problem. When the carbon dioxide gets too high, you go into acidosis, bad things happen. Uh, the people that I've seen do anesthesia in St. Cloud do a fine job. So I'm not worried about that. But um, it's good to challenge them. When they say, OK, I'm going to put you to sleep. I'm the one that's going to do that. Do you have any concerns? They'll say, are you allergic to anything? And of course, you want to mention, many people get horrible retching when they wake up because they get narcotics during the surgery. Well, give me the one that doesn't do retching. And they will. <laughs> you just have to ask for it. People have no idea that you can do a la carte anesthesia. You know, just say, well, you know, I threw up a lot, and I want you to prevent that. But just say, what are you going to do to protect my brain? That gets in their head like, oh, they're thinking about that. And I think that's probably all you need to do. And if you need open heart surgery, you need open heart surgery. You don't not do open heart surgery because you're worried it might contribute to dementia risk. But if you can do it uh, with a local, um, maybe you want to try that. So like your foot surgeries, your knees, they're even doing hips. The problem with a local anesthetic when you do a hip, I know when I had my hip replaced, they said, you know, it was barely, I don't know, four or six hours after the surgery. Oh, we're going to get out of bed now. I said, we are? <laughs> like, really? Well, you can if your hip's awake. But if you had a spinal, you couldn't do that. You would have to wait until your legs aren't floppy anymore that you can feel your feet on the ground before you can start rehabbing. And I believe in rehab as soon as possible after surgery. But if you can get a, a local or a regional anesthetic without the general, and it's feasible and your surgeon's OK with it, I think that's a good consideration. Um, and there are reasons why you'd rather have a general than local, but probably for another discussion. But um, if you've already had the surgeries, we can't go back and change that. But what we can do is maybe, if we have that as a risk factor, double down on the things that might happen uh, that are similar. So if you have untreated sleep apnea, we will get to talking about that. That's one of the biggest factors we see. 50% of people who have sleep apnea don't know they have it. And What's sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is a condition where you, um, for various reasons, usually obstruction in the back of your throat from soft tissue that collapses when you sleep. And it causes you to get low oxygen during your sleep time. Oxygen normally is 98%. It can go down into the 80s. And your brain does not like low oxygen. So low oxygen is bad for the brain. And um, in sleep apnea, it's only during the slow wave sleep. It's usually a two, hour, two or three hour window. But if you have low oxygen to your brain for two or three hours every night, imagine what that does to your brain. It's not good. And it's very treatable. I mean, you wear a device. It's, you see it on TV. They make fun of it all the time because now they want you to get the surgical procedure that is like a pacemaker in your throat. Talk to someone who had the pacemaker in your throat and see how much pain they had with that. It ain't much fun. But, um, we, ha we have another question about water and hydration. And then there was a question about if medications are water or fat soluble. I'm not sure if that was specifically for um, vitamins. Is no, what I'm it's for statins. Oh. <laughs> so I make a big deal out of this. And, and uh, statin drugs for cholesterol. And I think it's a controversial subject. And if you're related to a pharmaceutical rep, it's very controversial. But. Um, People who have high cholesterol who are substantial risk for coronary artery disease are on a statin. However, there's a lot of people who don't have substantial coronary artery disease risk and are on a statin. Because the guidelines say that your bad cholesterol, your LDL, should be below 130. Well, people on statins are being put on statins for an LDL of 135. Before any discussion of changing your diet, your exercise, your sleep habits, your social habits and on and on and stress. Uh, and you know, it's really easy. I can write a prescription for statin in less than three minutes. But to sit down and talk about those other things requires a half an hour. So which am I going to do if I'm a clinician? You know, most of the time, I just write the statin. Here, take this. 
Uh, but there are two kinds of statins, those that are fat soluble, and your brain is two thirds fat. Fat soluble medications get into your brain and water soluble ones theoretically don't. They do sometimes, but mostly they don't get into your brain. Statins, when they were first invented, caused a lot of cognitive dysfunction as a side effect. And it just turns out, in my personal opinion, the fat soluble ones are more likely to do that because they get into your brain and the water soluble ones don't. The water soluble ones are pravastatin and rosuvastatin. So Pravacol and Crestor. Uh, the other ones are mostly fat soluble ones. So in our, in, when we do our evaluations, we make recommendations. We generally recommend if this person really needs a statin, please consider switching to an equivalent dose or equally effective water soluble one. Now, you could argue against that. As I said, almost anything we say here, there'll be people that argue the opposite. Uh, but that's what they mean by water soluble. This is all Hello? This is also a really good time to remind you not to change your medicines without talking to your doctor. <laughs> yeah, please, please don't stop it because it, without talking it over. But I think, I know we were kind of brainwashed to think that everyone needs a statin and every medical problem is simply absence of the right pill. I prefer the water soluble ones. And the reason being that they don't get into the brain as much, we think. Uh, and are less likely to cause cognitive dysfunction. And I think any of the statins is capable of cognitive dis dysfunction, but it's by no means does it do that in every person. You can take statins your whole life and never have any cognitive deficit. The problem is, when you come into your doc family doctor's office time after time, when did they do a detailed three-hour cognitive assessment to see if the statin's causing you a deficit? They don't, they can't. And so your deficit, if you're a teacher, it'll take 10 years for any deficit to show. You have a fabulous, active, resilient mind. You're not gonna show that. Our, our tests for cognitive dysfunction are crude instruments. They don't pick up a little bit of cognitive failure very well. And so nobody does that. I've, I've never seen a heart doctor have cognitive testing done on a regular basis because 80% of their patients are on statins. But they don't do cognitive testing. And if you're a a very knowledgeable, active brain person, it's gonna be forever before that shows up because you've got a lot of cognitive reserve, as they say. Pat, just another, you talked a little bit about insurance coverage for you know the dementia care. Another question comes here is, what's been your experience with health insurance companies for the cost of home care or support for family caregivers? Well, uh, Support services, Tammy and Christina could tell you more about that. They're really up on that. But generally speaking, when we do our evaluations, we have to show that you have deficit written in that to allow for coverage to happen. They want to see you as sicker than well. Well, if you're well, they don't want to pay for it. So we don't mean to be critical in our reports when they say so-and-so has this deficit and that deficit. And their activities of daily living are inadequate for this and for that. But that's what it takes to get covered. If you don't look bad enough in the report, they're not gonna pay for it. They may, they may not pay for it anyway. 